morning, everybody. Um, and you're very welcome to the current issue of Let's Talk Dairy. On this episode of Let's Talk Dairy, I'm joined by Catherine McAloon. Catherine is a researcher and lecturer in veterinary medicine in UCD. Catherine, I should have asked you before you started, what's your what area, what field are you is your principal area of expertise in in, in the vet college? Thanks a million, George. Good morning. Um, yeah, well, I suppose I'm working in the section of herd health and animal husbandry. Um, so a nice job split between clinical teaching of veterinary students working in the hospital here. Um, we do a lot of herd health investigation on farms across the country and also some research. Um, I suppose calves are something very close to my heart. So I'm very passionate and, and interested in, in that area. OK, very good. And you're at that in that field for a number of years at this stage. So today we've got the glamorous uh, uh, topic of uh, preventing, or not, not so much preventing, more about dealing with uh, scouring calves. And so where I'd, I'd like to start our conversation, Catherine, is in the whole area of uh, the principal causes of scour in young calves. Yeah, so and I mean, they were, we're kind of dealing with because the let's talk dairy. It's, it's more dairy, dairy calves. calves. Than, yeah. Than well, I suppose, um, unfortunately, every farm has to deal with the scourge of, of scar um, year on year. I guess it's, it is biased data that comes into the regional vet labs because, you know, passive surveillance. But the number one pathogen, two number one and two pathogens it causing um, calf scar in Ireland would be rotavirus and cryptosporidium. I suppose if you were to, to split them up, the kind of main viral causes of, of um, scar or rotavirus and coronavirus. They tend to happen in calves sort of in from a week to a month or, you know, up six weeks of life, most commonly. But I think interestingly, cryptosporidium and also coccidiosis or, or blood scar, as it's known, would be the two main parasitic causes. Um, so it's actually really interesting that crypto, which is the scourge, I suppose, of a lot of calf scar problems, is actually a parasite. And that just means that it's incredibly resistant in the environment and hard to treat and so on. Um, coccidiosis is the blood scar, but it, it sort of takes about three weeks to complete its life cycle. So we tend not to see that in very young calves. It's kind of, you know, two and a half weeks onward. And of course, there are bacterial causes. So E. coli, for example, would tend to cause calf scar, but only in very young calves and usually when, you know, under a week old. And perhaps if there is um, an issue with uh, colostrum management, that kind of thing. And then you've weird and wonderful things like salmonella, maybe a bit older, but rotavirus crypto would be the headlines for us in Ireland. Roto and crypto. Rota. Um, and wh- how does it manifest itself then? What happens when a calf uh, gets has a scar? What happens to the calf? So I guess um, when a calf gets, uh, you know, these pathogens hit the um, hit the gut, they they really damage the natural um, defense mechanisms and the natural physiological me- mechanisms of of gut activity. So the gut is a long tube, as we know, but it's actually, you know, the the wine, the intestines, the the what it looks like. But within that, it's highly specialized, and it has these um, finger like villi projections, yeah. um, and basically they're the be all and end all of fluid and water and electrolyte absorption. So when you have crypto in there or rotavirus, they basically damage the normal function, which means that the calf can't absorb fluids and starts losing water, which is quickly followed by electrolytes. So the calf then scours this high volume watery feces. Um, and loses all the important salts, sodium chloride, potassium, and, and so on. So then you end up with a very sick, dehydrated calf. Mm. So it's that kind of gut wall um, is really where it's all happening. And is there any research done then, Catherine, on the long-term effects of a scour, a serious scour incident in the calf? Do we know in terms of how they perform afterwards, or, or is there a long-term carryover thing there? Yeah, so I suppose the traditional view would have been that a calf that gets, you know, an episode of scour can get over it, catch up and doesn't suffer the long term weight um, gain, you know, consequences that maybe you would see in a calf with pneumonia, which would be much more likely to have a long term downstream uh, lifetime effect. Yeah. Um, more recent research has actually shown that crypto, in fact, particularly in beef calves, I think there was a study there very recently that shown that, uh, you know, a significant episode of crypto could, in fact, have a long term, have a uh, more of a long term impact than we originally thought. So I guess it really depends how sick they are and for how long, but it's certainly not without its consequences. Yeah, I have an awful I have a feeling in the back of my head it was a colleague of mine who's involved heavily in contract rearing of heifers said that sick heifers were always about 30 kilos behind at breeding. I think it's quite it's quite significant. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Never mind the scourge of of 
dealing with it at the time. Yeah, you know that hardship people face is unbelievable. So but if we just move on then. That's what the core of what we're trying to cover here today is in in the whole area of treatment and other calves. Yeah. So I have a calf with scour. It's I just noticed it this morning. He's off. He's milky bit and looking a bit dehydrated. What am I going to do? So. I guess the signs of dehydration are, are pretty obvious. The kind of, you know, slightly sunken eye and, and so on, obviously progressing to the more severe cases where the eye is back in the head and calf, um, you know, is wobbly and weak. Yeah. So I guess the first thing is those mild cases, you know, will really benefit from from oral treat, oral fluid um, therapy. So regardless of the cause of, of scar, whether it's crypto or rotavirus or whatever, the treatment approach is largely the same. And the mainstay of treatment is trying to replace the fluid and electrolytes that are lost in the in this high volume scar. So um, that really revolves around trying to get in electrolytes in water. So as maybe extra feeds during the day. So you know, ideally that if they're having their, their milk feed and they should be offered their milk because it absolutely does not worsen scar and in fact has been shown to speed up recovery. If they're fit to drink their milk, that is, I wouldn't go stomach tubing it, but if they're fit to drink it, they should get it morning and evening. And the electrolytes um, should be offered separately as a separate feed entirely. So maybe at lunchtime and um, maybe before bed or, or whatever way you, it suits logistically. But the idea about those electrolytes uh, or, or oral fluid replacement therapy, as it's called, it's about getting in extra fluid. So although lots of the products claim that they can be given in milk, that largely defeats the purpose. So they should be given in water as an extra feed, completely separate to the milk feed. Um, I suppose that's really the, the backbone of treatment is trying to get those fluid in. So even if the calf is only kind of mildly affected, they will certainly benefit from an oral rehydration therapy. Um, you know, to a more severely affected calf, obviously, if, as long as they're up and about and, and able to take that that um electrolyte and, and fluid so you can give it in a in a bucket in a feeder whatever way if they won't drink it of course you can stomach tube it because it's fine to stomach tube electrolytes the same of course is is not true for for milk as those calves get older as well as electrolytes which if, as i said is definitely the, the backbone ideally you know we would try and remove the calf if it's only one or two um, and have some kind of hospital or isolation facility and, and i know that can be highly impractical in an outbreak scenario but if we do get in in time that can make a difference because the infectious dose is extremely low, um, which, and you know, when a calf is scarring, they're spewing out millions of eggs and, and so on, if it was crypto, for example. And that is enough to set up infection in, in very many calves. So you'll ramp up the infection very quickly in the shed with one or two scarring uh, calves. So if we can remove them and isolate them, we're practical. That's a sensible thing to do. The mainstay of their treatment is to is the oral fluids and continuing to offer milk if they want to drink it. And then, of course, depending on what you have, there are other treatments. The medication on top of that as well, for depending on the bacteria that's caused. How do you know which, uh, or bacteria or parasite, how do you know which is causing the problem? How do you determine that? So you certainly can't tell by looking at it. Um, there, you know, ultimately you need a sample and you need to know what you're dealing with because, you know, if you end up with, you know, four or five calves scarring, you, you really want to know what's in there. Yeah. You know, if it was crypto, for example, you know, there are things, it's a zoonotic pathogen, which means it can infect humans. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that scenario, you know, we'd want to know if young calves are, um, if they had it that, you know, the children or maybe well, immunocompromised yeah, people wouldn't be yeah. dealing with those calves because they could catch the infection themselves. So yeah. if it, things like that, you, you really want to know. And also for things like um, for crypto, there might be um, drugs like Halicure or Parfor or something yeah. ancillary to the fluid treatment that you might give that you would certainly not dream of giving if it wasn't crypto. Yeah. Additionally, for blood scar, you know, again, they'd have their own treatments. So in addition to the fluids. So really getting a sample to your vet. They have rapid test kits, so they can usually turn the them around very quickly or perhaps it needs to go to the lab but trying to get a handle on what's in there is sensible because then that will direct if further treatment is needed yeah, just giving the calf a jab of antibiotics when you see it's sick is not necessarily the right uh, the right first step really sure is not no and in actual fact you, the, you know the large majority of, of as i mentioned rotavirus and cryptosporidium are, are not bacterial in origin and exactly. you know those calves will not benefit from antibiotics so oh. um really they shouldn't be getting them at the most the vast majority of you know mild to moderate cases of scar that are still up and unable to drink their milk and you're able to manage them don't need antibiotics at all but that being said you know obviously the very sick ones most certainly do and, and we shouldn't be afraid to give them 
you know, the, the calf that's that's down or has maybe take, you know, well off its feed for a couple of days, has a fever, certainly if there's any blood in the in the dung or anything like that, those calves do need antibiotics so and should get it and, and you should speak to your vet about an appropriate um drug for that and a and a an approach to treatment on your farm. Yeah. So if needed, give it to them, but the vast majority, I suppose, don't don't. Exactly. Now, if we just move on then to the, the third and final part of the whole conversation we want to have here, tell us a bit about uh, prevention then. I mean, prevention is better than cure, as they say. So where do you start in, from a prevention perspective? Yeah, so I think, although sometimes this can sound very abstract, I guess the devil really is in the detail when it comes down to prevention of, of calf diarrhea. And um, the, regardless of the of the type of scour that you have on the farm, the principles of an of an infectious disease control in calves is largely, you know, broadly similar. So it focuses on two pillars. One is getting the calf to be as absolutely immune as you possibly can, yeah. which really is about the colostrum picture. So, and and I would go further in that it is not just about the one, two, three, getting them enough colostrum of good quality and quickly. Um, that you know, it's about how that colostrum is if it's hygienically harvested and stored properly and so on can really make a difference to the the bang that the for the book that the calf gets out of it so yeah. optimizing colostrum at all costs because you know if you have calves dying of scour there's often you know two reasons there's often more than one pathogen involved but also they're often you know maybe on the edge of of, of colostrum management and, and so good colostrum and, and and everything we can do to make marginal improvements in that is probably the main the first thing we can do in terms of their resistance, yep. feeding them well, so feeding them enough milk so that they can grow and keep warm and fight infection is imp- so. If we're feeding calves on a very marginal feed rate of ten percent of body weight or something like that, and yeah. um, that's just not enough for them to fight infection. So, you know, underfed calves and cold stress calves become sick calves. So, good colostrum management and feeding them on a proper plane of nutrition, you know, a, a minimum fifteen percent of body weight, keeping them yeah. warm and, and good housing, yeah. things like that, is sort of the first half and then the second half of or the other pillar that I mentioned would be trying to reduce the amount of infection they become exposed to and infection pressure and that's really all about hygiene so the cabin pen and um, the beds the colostrum feeding equipment the calf feeding equipment the calf pens you know things like you know are the calf pens able to be kept dry um, things like that, and, and it's kind of hard to keep a calf pen dry and clean at the same time because you usually change the power hose. It, you know what I mean? Yes, and we really don't want to do that in season, particularly if there's calves in situ in the shed because we're just right. going to add a whole more moisture and possibly aer- aerosolize infection and things like that. So, there's a couple of things around the hygiene piece that I would also mention. Um, that you know, crypto, for example, because it is a parasite with a you know double walled outer shell on the eggs, yeah. incredibly can hang around from one year to the next. So, and most farm disinfectants don't actually most you know standard farm grade disinfectant have no f- efficacy at all on crypto or coxie because they're they're parasites. So, we really need to be using specialized disinfectants on that very important day where the calf sheds are cleaned and um, steam cleaning, giving them a rest between calving seasons, if you've, you know, or between, you know, a batch of calves, if possible. And um, within the season, then it's about trying to come up with kind of bespoke sensible solutions to keep it dry. We're probably not going to be going in with a power hose, but trying to keep it as clean as we can. But we can use some of those disinfectants, for example, um, that are active against crypto in a foot dip, even, you know, yeah. even something like that might help make a difference yeah i suppose uh one of the standouts for me over the last couple of years working with the, on the calf care events with you is the number of people who think that when a calf is sick you take it off milk and the rows that we get um with, with generally with uh farming older farming people about that particular area i remember a one or two stand-up rows in the past yes i think <laughs> i think i might have been the target of some of those rows in the mean, yeah. <laughs> past church, but yeah 100 percent is both milk and fluids they get Yes, because, you know, there's lots and lots of studies. That's an over there's overwhelming evidence now that shows that by taking them off milk, we actually starve the calf Um, and electrolytes are great at replacing electrolytes, but they tend to be quite low in energy. So the calf needs energy to fight infection Um, and also milk is is good at recovery and and eating gut recovery and things like that. So if the calf is fit to drink it, I wouldn't force it upon it, um, but they should certainly be offered their normal milk feeds and should be capable of some growth. you know, if they're only mildly affected. So I yeah. uh, keep the milk to them. Um, certainly overwhelming evidence to say absolutely. Okay, that's great. That's good to know. 
Uh, look at uh, ladies and gentlemen. If anyone has any any last questions for Catherine, um, we we'll, we we'll take them now. We can put them into your your chat box there, your or your what is the question and answer piece. Uh, if not, I suppose uh, in summary, Catherine, a couple of things: rotavirus and crypto seem to be the big ones. Yeah, uh, with a whole heap of them, and and neither of them are bacterial, so uh, an, yeah. antibiotics is not going to cure either of them. No, the bacteria, the antibiotic piece really is for secondary infection in, in, a, in a sick calf that's quite severely infected. And um, one thing I actually forgot to mention, George, I think would be important, I suppose we're still in, in early January and there, there might be some time if farms are considering it, um, is that there is a cow vaccination. So it needs to be in sort of three weeks before they calve to, to have the desired effect at making the um, cholesterol antibodies against rotavirus. So, you know, the scar vaccine in cows can be helpful. And even in farms that have crypto problems, if you can remove at least one pathogen off the playing field um, or at least reduce it, control it. So the, the scar vaccines are, are very helpful in um, increasing cholesterol antibodies against, um, you know, E. coli and rotor coronavirus. So they are something to consider um, in the toolkit as well. A question that came in there was um, about transition milk. So if we have sickish calves um, and they're on, say, a powder, say 750 grams of powder and six litres, whatever the, the rate you're feeding is, would we, could we mix some transition milk in, or colostrum even into the, into the milk solution that they're being fed? Would that help? <clears throat> yeah, so that's an interesting question. And I think I suppose, you know, farmers do it and, and do it successfully. Um, I think the issue for me is that if you're going to feed transition milk, that's great and, and feed it, you know, in, in that early, in that first week in life and so on. But once they move on to powder, I guess it's another dietary change. So yeah. um, if you've spent the money on on scar vaccines, there is a, an effect of that. Although the colostrum antibodies are, are not absorbed after the first you know, few hours, yeah, first 12 yeah. hours of life, um, there is a local effect in the gut of colostrum and, and transition milk of those antibodies. So ideally they would stay on it before their transition you know if they're going if you're going to do that that you do that for you know day two to seven or, or whatever works for the farm and um, I think the issue with with dilution and mixing around two feeds it, it, it can be done but yeah. you just want to be careful about a dietary change on top of a yeah, very no. upset gut and, and sometimes it could make things worse so you know there's no I would say science one not that at least I'm aware of that says you know absolutely do this or absolutely don't I think I'm probably not a huge fan of mixing and matching transition milk is great feed it properly and first but once they move on um I'd be trying to to reduce the dietary changes if possible okay so keep them nice and steady if they calf as a temperature with the scour what would you do well, actually, um, regardless of a temperature or not, um, lots of scarring calves, you know, the, it's painful, you know, gut contraction and so on can yeah. actually can really benefit from a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, which, of course, yeah. you'll have to get from your vet. And, and really, you would need to agree that, you know, a treatment approach with your vet so that, you know, if you have that in stock you're on farm, you're going to be able to use it. So if a calf has a fever, you need to treat the fever with, an, with a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. But I would go a step further that lots of, um, you know, calves with a, you know, that are affected by scar, even in the absence of fever would probably benefit from a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory as long as you're they're drinking um yeah. if they're off the sock completely and um, then that that might not be true an anti-inflammatory an anti-inflammatory well you, you would need to correct the fluid so if, it, if they're completely off the sock they're going to need veterinary intervention you know if they're not taken yeah. for multiple feeds a day for example like that that calf you're going to struggle to keep it hydrated with oral fluids and that's likely to a calf that's going you know going to go downhill and maybe need a drip um, and if that's the case then certainly, but I wouldn't be bandying around non-steroidal anti-inflammatory unless, you know, it's a sick calf that needs it. Um, but non-steroidals or, or anti-inflammatory drugs, um, they uh, have a benefit, certainly, um, even if the calf isn't showing fever, but they must get it if they have a fever. Okay, very good. So you, you just answered your second question, Catherine, there. So there's another question in here. Some farms use a calf or sheep stats without bedding in the young calf pens in the belief that bedding holes and spread scour. Any ideas or thoughts on this practice, uh, Catherine? Um, so I suppose I've had problems with individual pens, you know, crypto outbreaks, you know, things that like wooden slats that are, you know, hang around in an individual pen for that calf for, and, and from year on year and, and the wood is porous. So and yep. it's a difficult um, method to deal with uh, to properly clean those in those calf pens if, with those slats. Um, so bedding is the same as, as dry cows. 
it doesn't matter as long as it's how the bedding is managed as opposed to the bedding itself per se. So if you can keep plenty of dry straw to them then and keep them dry and clean and, and so on, then then it's not necessarily. The, the issue, of course, is, is how you manage it. So I wouldn't yeah. say that it's a benefit of one over the other because um, slats can be difficult, um, particularly wood that's porous yeah. and difficult to clean. Yeah. Um, so the bedding itself isn't necessarily the issue if you can keep. Um, but of course, obviously, if you have a scouring calf on a straw bed, it's going to be very difficult to keep it dry and, and clean and not ramp up the infection unless you can pull the calf away um, you know, from, from its cohorts or whatever. So I have no issue with bedding, but it's the management of it really is the key for management of crypto and things like that. You, you'd nearly imagine you'd be better on a bed in a way, Catherine, because it'll keep them a bit warmer. Yes. So that's, I suppose, a huge thing in calves. So I've mm -hmm. alluded kind of briefly there to cold stress, but yeah. under three weeks, four weeks of age, a calf... You know, Doesn't under ever. 15 degrees, basically. So pretty much every day in spring in Ireland needs to use energy to keep warm. So that's feed energy that they're using um, to keep themselves alive, to grow, to run an immune system, but also to keep themselves warm. So um, they become cold stressed very quickly. So if you have a calf lying on a wet bed, so on a wet yeah. bed of straw, on concrete or slats or something like that, um, they're losing heat energy to the floor. So they're, yeah. they're into the cold and that becomes your cold stress calf and they find it harder to fight infection. And certainly temperature control in, in that young calf is something than that we'd see in, in an outbreak scenario, you know, that um, particularly in calves under three weeks old. Um, so really, the straw is absolutely necessary to keep them warm, keep them cosy, as long as we can manage it correctly. Yeah, yeah. To me, to me and to be straight about it, I, I'd say you'd be looking at deep beds of straw for sick calves. Absolutely. Better for well calves. That, that's how, that'd be my call on it anyway. I know I there's think... a bit of hassle, but better, better with them. Better with them for welfare and everything else, but yeah. particularly uh, from the keeping warm piece because a cold stress calf get sick so if it's lying on a wet bed or a concrete floor or something like that it's losing heat energy and if and a scoury calf with stuff running through it is not going to be a warm calf uh, no and, and you know some of those those will benefit from the hospital pen maybe with an infrared lamp and so on if we if we have it um but of course uh, you know practicalities in spring um if we've 10 if one calf maybe not so bad if, if it becomes 10 it's it's more difficult Ladies and gentlemen, with, with your permission, um, I'm going to, we're going to conclude there. I, I thank Catherine for her contribution. I find Catherine an absolute mind of information on calves and calf rearing. And she's 99% of the time she's right as well. She's a hard, <laughs> a hard thing for me to say about anyone. But anyway, that's the truth. So Thanks, listen, George. Oh, hang on, Catherine. One more question. This is the last question, I promise you. Calf coat. Now, we had that one last week now, Ned, in fairness. Calf coats is the question. Yeah, so again, they're, you know, hugely positive um, advent to the calf rearing in that they really help tackle that cold stress piece. Yeah. So in that calf under three or four weeks of age, that's using feed energy to keep warm. Um, they, that's where that really comes in. So it really helps the calf to, to maintain body temperature, which means it's not a cold stress calf and so on. Um, so yes, they absolutely work. Um, I'm a big fan of them. Yeah, and I, I covered it. We covered it last week, Ned, as well. So I think they're the equivalent of 10 or 15 degrees of warmth anyway. So for young calves, if you're for sick calves, they're a right help. Definitely, yeah. Just, that or a red lamp, uh, Catherine? Uh, yeah, no, definitely. Just uh, they need to be, you know, they can also be a vehicle. So if they're on a sick calf who's scarring and things like that, they'll have to be washed, obviously. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't tell don't tell anyone in the household you're using the <laughs> <laughs> We'll leave it at that. And thanks very much, Catherine, and uh, the very best of luck. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. We're All the best for the spring. Week. We're on calf rearing again next week and our calf care series of events with AHI and all the co-ops and all the rest of it continue this week. And we're getting big, big crowds at them. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, George.